My task today is to explain the evolution of how we are moving towards a postmodern form of state in just a few slides. I'm going to begin by a literary tour. In 1949, a famous American political scientist named Harold Laswell uh, published a book called Essays on the Garrison State. What he meant by garrison state was that military elites had acquired or were accruing so much influence in politics that they were becoming a new kind of political elite shaping the structure and hierarchy of power within a country. He was looking at the United States and Japan and other countries. And this is in the early Cold War. It was that trend that during the Cold War prompted President Eisenhower in the United States in the 1960s to speak warningly of the emerging military industrial complex. But as the Cold War went on, we began to think about different foundations of power beyond just the military. Philip Bobbitt, another uh, influential American uh, legal scholar, wrote a book called The Shield of Achilles. He, and he wrote about the evolution of international order and systems. But within that, he argued that the most successful and influential states of the future would not be simply those that had the most military power, but those that maximize the individual uh, economic liberty and freedom and opportunity of their citizens. At around the same time, a Japanese a McKinsey consultant named Kenichi Ome wrote a book called The Next Global Stage. And what uh, Kenichi Ome argued is that we are moving beyond just nation states as the unit of power in the international system. He wrote instead about clusters of cities cooperating with each other into what he called region states and also market states and city states. In fact, he hearkened back to the Hanseatic League of the Middle Ages to describe how cities could collaborate with each other and they would be the fundamental economic and political building blocks of the future. What we learn to appreciate through looking at those books and many others that have been written in the last 20 or 30 years on the subject of what constitutes a state, what makes it powerful and successful, is that we are constantly changing our appreciation of what the foundations of that power is. Geopolitics is the science, the study in international relations of power and hierarchy. It actually dates back to the 19th century. And when you study geopolitics, you think about things like territorial size, population size, uh, natural resource base, military assets, power projection capability, the balance of power. But after a century of geopolitical theory dominating the way in which we interpret change in, in international relations, we started to talk about geoeconomics towards the late Cold War. And that was the approach that influenced people like uh, Philip Bobbitt and Kenichi Ome. And in geoeconomics, you look at a different set of factors as being just as or more important. Factors like the GDP size of a country, uh, its productive uh, capacity, uh, its FDI and capital stock, and a, a variety of other factors, currency reserves, for example. I believe that as we move into the 21st century, we have to move beyond just geopolitics and geoeconomics and think about geotechnology. How is it that technology, in fact, serves as the driver of what shapes commercial and economic success, and how does that translate into strategic leverage in geopolitics? And I believe that this geotechnology has always been there, but has been a major missing lens in our analysis. And yet today, in the 21st century, if you look at the diffusion of innovation around the world, you come to see that, in fact, the way in which technology and innovation in leading, e leading technological sectors is spreading so quickly, it is, a, it is a very important indicator of future geopolitical shifts. Now, the map of global invention and innovation just 20 years ago would have been so largely concentrated in the Western world and the OECD countries, including Japan. But today, when you look at innovation in very key technological areas, information technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology, uh, alternative energy, and so forth, you can see that the map is diversifying tremendously and very quickly. And so even states that don't have a tremendous amount of military power, uh, like Japan, like India, like Singapore, uh, can very much factor into the map of the future. Indeed, whereas this little island was derisively referred to once as the little red dot, I believe in some ways it is a harbinger of what we will come after the garrison state, after the market state, after the region state. It is what I call the info state. How is it that Singapore uh, is becoming this, this entity that I would call the info state? It does it by uh, delivering to citizens not just commercial opportunity, 
and not just security, but also connectedness. If information is power, if knowledge is power, which has become such a cliche for all of us, how does that manifest into a new kind of governance? Well, what Singapore does offer is, again, those traditional forms of security and well-being, but also a society that is information rich, one that is connected, one where, for example, uh, fiber optic ac access to the internet is being uh, deployed and spread around the country, and yet can also connecting this city to the rest of the world as efficiently as possible. And that is one of the fundamental building blocks of the info state that may not be the case in a market state. A place like a country like Qatar, which is a very large uh, gas producing country, is certainly a market state. It lives and dies by the price of oil and gas in financial markets, but it is by no means an info state. So this, there's something unique that is happening around the world as certain places, particularly city states like Singapore, uh, not only become wealthy through commercial prowess, but also saturate themselves in an information environment. For those of you who have not been uh, to the CREATE uh, campus uh, near the National University of Singapore, you will find that the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, as well as MIT, have set up le research labs there around city, the future city laboratory. And what they're doing there is looking at all of the ways in which the data that is collected, the data that is provided, and that circulates uh, in Singapore, whether it's mobile phones or geolocation of taxis uh, and provision of services and so forth, how can we use all of that data to enhance uh, the quality of governance? And that is another important aspect of the info state. Not only does everyone have access to information and empowered by it, but it is used in real-time governance. Now, in the late Cold War and, um, and even in the last decade, there has been a large debate in, pol in political science about uh, uh, democracy versus so-called Asian values. The idea that there was a big dichotomy between uh, a Western preference for democratic regimes and a Confucian-inspired non-democratic uh, system of governments in Asia. But that debate is slowly melting away. What the, happens in the info state and the solution that the info state can provide is a kind of real-time governance based upon data. Not a responsiveness and accountability that depends on election every four years, and not a sense of a benevolent hierarchy uh, based on certain uh, uh, cultural traditions, but rather the ability to govern societies in real time, to respond to people's needs, to, f to bridge and fill gaps uh, wherever they are. That can only be done rapidly and efficiently in a place that is an info state. The other thing that we're seeing info states doing around the world, and here for the first time I'm mentioning other ones as well, places like New York City, uh, Switzerland, Estonia, Israel, these are places, they are countries, there are cities within those countries. Sometimes it's the capital city, sometimes it's not the capital city. But if you take a place like New York City, which I think of as an info state as well, it is neither um, an independent state nor is it the capital of the United States of America, but it very much does what I'm depicting here. It forges its own diplomatic and functional relationships with other cities around the world in its best interest. It has its own immigration strategy around recruiting talent. It has its own security policy, networking with secret services and military agents around the world to figure out how to best secure New York City, especially after the tragedy of 9-11 a decade ago. It has its own climate and environmental policy. Some of the strictest environmental building standards in the world are now being deployed in New York City. Not anywhere else in the United States is that being done. It's based upon the vision of the mayor. It's based upon the commitment of the companies. It's based upon the talent and knowledge of the academics and researchers that are living in New York City. So networks of city of info states are increasingly conducting their own diplomacy with each other. So as I like to say, info states of the world should unite. Now, what we can learn from info states are among the following uh, sorts of, sorts of um, uh, lessons. Not only the hybrid governance, again, transcending the debate about democracy versus uh, non-democracy, and instead thinking about how do we use all of the resources, talents, companies, civic actors, uh, and government agencies together to form a new kind of government that's based on harnessing data. That's one thing. A generative social system. When everyone has access to information resources and transparency, you can have far more inclusiveness no matter what kind of government uh, you have. And this is certainly one thing that Singapore uh, needs to do uh, even more of. As information spreads around the society, how can all citizens be engaged? One first step is the national conversation that is uh, beginning this year. 
the diplomacy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, not waiting for, uh, for uh, federal governments to find solutions for you, but rather cities reaching out on their own to partner with others as best they can. Fortunately for Singapore, the city and the state overlap, so this is less of a challenge. And techno-cosmopolitanism. The people uh, come to Singapore, and Singapore, like London or New York City, uh, are very rich, uh, multicultural, multiracial uh, societies. And yet, there is increasingly a sense that one is here to enjoy this secure connectedness and to take advantage of it, uh, irrespective of where one comes from. And that is certainly uh, a cosmopolitan vision coming true. And finally, the notion of global citizenship. Uh, a good friend of mine, the scholar Daniel Bell, who lives in, um, in Beijing, has just written a book called The Spirit of Cities. And in that book, he talks about how in the next phase of identity for each of us, we, our loyalty to the city may actually become greater than our loyalty to the country. And therefore, we will think of ourselves not just as citizens, but as citizens. And I hope, my hope for Singapore is that it leads the way in teaching people what constitutes good global citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.